Welcome Kemasabi, I'm Detective Lloyd Gross and this is the Dexter Scranton Strangler Connection episode of the Anti-Strangling Task Force. There is a cryptic link between the show Dexter and the Scranton Strangler mystery. In season 6 of Dexter, episode 5, The Angel of Death, Dexter is seen using a saber printer. I was right about the glue. A polyvinyl acetate polymer. Fans have speculated for some time the significance of this, but have truly failed to unlock the Scranton Strangler puzzle that is hidden within the show. Dexter is pointing us back to the office, and specifically season 6, episode 15, Saber. This is the episode where we are finally introduced to Gabe, and the merger between Saber and Dunder Mifflin has been finalized. The absolute embodiment of Saber within this episode is the Saber corporate video. In fact, this episode has no deleted scenes available on the DVDs. The only bonus material available is the corporate video. What has not been revealed until this moment is that the Saber corporate video is not some comedically humorous nonsensical jargon, but rather it is a puzzle and specifically it is a riddle. The riddle can be broken down into three parts. The road that rises, the past and future, and the tasty rainbow. Christian Slater starts by revealing to us the nature of the challenge. Working at Sabre means taking on the challenge of the road that rises to meet you. Taking on the challenge of the road that rises to meet you. So we're being encouraged to take on a challenge. The challenge relates to the road that rises. And at the end of the road, it will meet you. So we're looking for a road. And the road must be assumed to be in Scranton. So which road could it be? Well, it's Dexter who gives us the answer to this. Approximately three and a half miles from the Lackawanna County Coroner's Office in West Scranton, there is a road called Dexter Avenue. Dexter Avenue at its southern end connects from Jackson Street and extends all the way north to Swetland Street intersection, where it then evolves to North Dexter Avenue. This is the road that rises. Dexter Avenue to North Dexter Avenue, West Scranton. But it's also the road that rises to meet you. North Dexter Avenue finishes at Pettibone Street intersection. The name Pettibone is a derivation from a French name, meaning small and good. This is a penis joke, and I feel personally attacked. This is the first part of the riddle solved. This is the road that rises to meet you, but the challenge isn't over yet. To confirm our discovery, we need to skip ahead to the tasty rainbow prophecy. Have you ever tasted a rainbow at Sabre? You will. Have you ever tasted a rainbow? At Sabre, you will. What is the tasty rainbow? Surrounding the midsection of Dexter Avenue, there are five food-related businesses. Pizza Avenue Pizza, St. Anne's Food Pantry Food Distribution Center, Orlando Foods, UTZ Quality Foods, and Jerity's Supermarkets Corporate Office. When you link these five businesses together, they form an arc of a rainbow, with each business forming the colors of the rainbow. But not just any rainbow, it's an inverted rainbow. Now, the concept of inversion 
is prevalent throughout the office, which links into the inversion principle. Now, I haven't covered the inversion principle just yet. It's going to be covered very soon. So make sure you subscribe, hit the notifications, like this video, comment, and stay tuned for the inversion principle. But the concept of inversion is incredibly important and is a consistent pattern throughout the show. And that'll be touched on a little bit later in this episode. But this is the tasty rainbow and forms the answer to the third part of the riddle. So now we are left with the final piece. Saber is respecting the past, but opening the window to the future. Respecting the past, but opening a window to the future. This is the most difficult part of the entire riddle. Ultimately, we are being directed back to Dexter Avenue and what lies on Dexter Avenue. Dexter Avenue is a residential street. It is overwhelmingly populated by residential housing. So we are looking for a property that respects the past, but gives us an understanding of the future. So to understand the past, we need to go back in time in the office first. And to a past episode, specifically the delivery. The delivery is the episode where Pam is having Cece. Andy rocks up to the hospital with his gift, which was a framed newspaper. However, the delivery takes a little bit longer than expected. And ultimately, Cece is born on the day where the Scranton Strangler strikes again. This is the infamous moment where the Scranton Strangler is revealed to the office audience. Now on the front page of this paper, there is an image of a house, the location and origin of which has largely been unknown until now. The image is on a Scranton Times Tribune mock-up. The initial analysis led me to believe that the image was in fact real and not a prop. And not only was it a real image, but an image of a real and actual crime scene that happened in the past. Now, this wouldn't be the first time that the office creators used a real image in the show. An excellent example of this is 401 Adams Avenue, Scranton. This building is the same building that we see in the pilot episode, albeit for a very brief moment. And this is also another notable example where the interpretation thus far has been incorrect. 401 Adams Avenue is assumed to be the building that Dunder Mifflin is in, in the pilot episode. But this is also incorrect, and that will be revealed when the Anti-Strangling Task Force analyzes the pilot. So given that the pilot episode's image is a real location in Scranton, I ascertained that the Scranton Strangler Strikes Again image must also be real. Not only that, the image looked like a media image. It looked like a picture that was already in a newspaper prior to this particular moment. The natural assumption for which paper it could be is the Scranton Times Tribune. So I called the Scranton Times Tribune from Australia to try and find the origin of this image. And I was very fortunate enough to be connected to a gentleman by the name of Brian. Brian works in the library archives of the Times Tribune and has actually been mentioned on the Office Ladies podcast for an article he wrote in the past. After sharing with him my suspicions around the photo, he informed me that the office creators and producers did liaise with two members of staff during production. However, they were no longer at the Times Tribune. He kindly offered to reach out to them via email and find out whether the image did in fact come from a previous publication. Brian got back to me within 24 hours. And I wanna take this moment to thank Brian once again. 
Guys, Brian provided us with the missing link of this riddle. So please shoot a comment down below for Brian and thank him because we wouldn't be in this position without his help. Before I reveal the origin of the photo, I must warn you that the truth is very dark. It is morbid, it is not humorous or entertaining, and it's certainly going to raise some serious, serious questions among Office fans. So, is it a real image? And the answer is yes. This is, in fact, an image from a real triple homicide that happened in Scranton in 2008. The tragedy occurred at 1604 South Irving Avenue, Scranton. This is the original photo and this is the original story. I sourced this story from the archives. This is exactly how it was printed at the time. The story was widely covered over the course of a number of months and was also reported on television. Covered from every angle. What happened, reaction, and how they captured the killer. This is still a developing story. In fact, that suspect arrested just moments ago. More on that in a moment. But first of all, it all began here at 1604 South Irving Avenue in South Scranton early this morning. Let me show you some video of the crime scene taken throughout the day today. Again, police got a 911 call just before 7 a.m. that there were three dead people inside this house. When they got here, they found three people, 20-year-old Justin Barrios, 22-year-old Dustin Hintz, and 16-year-old Leslie Collier. They were all dead in the house. We're not saying how they died. We do understand a gunshot may have been involved. There were other, also four other people inside the house. They were spared, investigators say. They were bound and gagged. Four people were found. One of them were able to uh, wiggle free of their binds and call police 911. And then a search began for 25-year-old Randall Rushing. Rushing, they say, was the killer. He was picked up in Wilkesbury at about 4.30 this afternoon. My IT partner, Mike Trim, is live in Wilkesbury. He joins now live with that part of the story. Mike, uh, what can you tell us what happened? Well, Andy, I'm standing on High Street in the Heights section of Wilkesbury. Behind me, there's a white house where people are standing in front of. That's where Rushing was arrested at about 4.30 this afternoon. Let me show you video of when police apprehended him. Randall, why'd you do it? There you go. That is Randall Rushing being arrested. And he was talking to reporters. You can see he's laughing as he's being led to the police car. Now, you can see also video is going to come up of FBI, local state police at the man's house that he was caught at. It's not clear what his connection to this house is, but we can tell you that a car that he ditched here on High Street led police to the crime scene. It led to an all-day search. You could see helicopters in the air. You're going to also see cars, state police troopers on the ground searching for rushing. Here's what the Luzerne County District Attorney said as far as help from all the FBI, ATF, and agencies. I believe it was the severity of the crime because there were three individuals who were killed. All law enforcement in the area offered their help, and we, you know, we agreed to accept the assistance. Back here in Wilkesbury, we're told rushing was taken to the Scranton Police Department, where he, where he will be booked, and of course he'll be arraigned later tonight. We are all over this story, and Andy, I'm going to throw it back to you now. Okay, Mike, thank you. As you can well imagine, this neighborhood in South Scranton really on edge all day long today, wondering what happened inside this house again at 1604 South Irving. My colleague, Eric Gable, has been here all day long. In fact, you were one of the first on the scene. Lots of emotion here today, a lot of uh, disbelief. Andy, shock and sadness are really the two key words that fill this South Scranton neighborhood tonight. Shock and sadness because three people who lived in this community are now dead. Again, Justin Berrios, Dustin Hintz, and Leslie Collier. A lot of their friends, their family, have shown up here to the scene throughout the day, and we spoke with them. As the rain poured down, the friends of 16-year-old Leslie Collier held rosaries, holding out hope. Shortly thereafter, they learned Collier, who was going into his junior year at Scranton High School, was murdered. He's the best guy, like, you ever, could ever meet. Ever. He helped you through anything, no matter what, no matter if it took away from him or not. Friends comforted each other as best they could. Dan Price worked with Leslie at the New Life Baptist Church. This is a rough area. There's there's a lot of people around here that um, that are not easy to deal with. 
Jose Barrios is the father of one of the two other victims, 20-year-old Justin Barrios. He was overcome with emotion after hearing the news. My son is a nice guy. No troublemaker or nothing. Barrios said his son grew up in West Side and vows to get revenge on the suspect, Randall Rushing, when he goes to prison. But, like I say, the Cody guy, they bring him to the county jail, and I say right in front, of and your camera, I get in there somehow, and I get him, believe me. Again, a sad situation here in South Scranton as three lives are lost. Four other people survived, including a two-year-old girl, two females, and another person, Cynthia Collier, who is 43, Andy. Again, the suspect is en route back here to Scranton to the police department, where he will be arraigned at some point later on tonight. And again, as you know, as we tell the people at home, we found out uh, just a short time ago that one of the women who survived, uh, in their terms, spared by rushing, was the sister of one of the murder victims. That was Samantha uh, Hintz. Samantha Hintz, uh, the sister of Dustin Hintz, and a Apparently, Samantha had a relationship with Randall Rushing. That's what police are telling us at this hour. Again, uh, Rushing now on his way back here to Scranton. He'll be arraigned on triple homicide charges later tonight. Our team coverage continues uh, later throughout the evening. For now, Andy Mahalshik live in South Scranton along with Eric Dable. Drew and Candace, back to you. No, Andy, I can't uh, imagine the horror stories those surviving victims must be telling the police tonight. Well, that's right. In fact, uh, we were trying to, uh, uh, f first of all, the good news is they were not injured. Of course, they're shaken up, Eric, as, as the uh, police chief, Dave Elliott, and the DA, Andrew Jarbola, told us. But again, apparently, c can't even imagine being in that house, knowing that uh, three people were, bad things were happening to them in the same house, and you're tied and gagged, you can't do anything about it. And then to finally free yourself and find the bodies, it's just a horrible situation. You can't even imagine how, what the nightmare they were living throughout the night last night. Andy, did police say anything at all about a possible motive? Well, again, we were talking before, Eric, about this relationship, and that's, that's what they think might have happened here. Yes, yeah, Samantha Hintz, one of the women who did survive, had a relationship with the suspect who is now going to be charged with the triple murder. And they don't know exactly how that factors in because it is so early in this investigation, but they're keying in on that right now. And we also know, guys, that all uh, of the people, including Rushing, lived in this house you see behind the 1604. And neighbors told us last night, again, they heard some popping sounds. Again, police are not saying they were shot to death or beaten to death, just saying that it was a gruesome sight indeed. But they all lived in this house for at least some time. Randall Rushing lived in the basement, and something happened last night or in the last couple of days to trigger uh, some kind of a release of emotion and anger. And again, associate police and the murders happened sometime overnight or early this morning. Drew Candace, back to you. All okay, right. Andy, thank you. Thank you. Approximately four months after the tragedy, the house was set on fire with the police believing that it was an intentional arson attack. It's from this article we find out that soon after the murders, the county condemned the property and marked it for demolition. According to the article of November 11th, 2008, a passerby reported the fire at 4.16 a.m. Sunday, according to the Lackawanna County Communications Center. Investigators ruled the fire and arson Monday afternoon. Scranton Detective Acting Captain Al Leoncini said he declined to provide additional information. The house was condemned within a week of the murders. The fire has prompted city officials to pursue demolition proceedings at a quicker pace. Mark Seisinger, City Director of Licensing, Inspections and Permits said, Right now we're going through the process of demolition. But nothing is final, he said. It was something we were looking at, but this speeds it up. Then towards the end of the article, for neighbors, the house is a daily reminder of the horror that unfolded on their street. They have to demolish it. There is no question about it, said Andrew Laskowski, who has lived two doors up from the house for 22 years. Following the fire, the demolition was expedited and soon after the house demolished. When you search the address now, you will still see the power lines, the trees are still there, but the house is gone. Now, I don't want to spend any more time about the tragedy because it is a real tragedy. Real crimes, heartbreak, and sorrow are linked to this photo. And it is not my intention to open up old wounds, glorify or celebrate objectionable moral tragedies, or offend and outrage any of the victims' families. But the creators of the show did use this photo 
18 months or so later in the delivery episode after the house had already been demolished. As questionable as that may be, this is the first part of the riddle regarding respecting the past, notwithstanding whether one can truly consider this sincere respect, especially from the perspective of those who had suffered. But what about the window to the future? In the office universe, this is the house where the Scranton Strangler strikes again. In our world, however, it believably no longer existed at the time of this episode airing. So the question is this, where is this house located? in the office universe? And the answer is in the riddle. Dexter Avenue, West Scranton. Respecting the past while opening up a window to the future. Have you ever tasted a rainbow? The road that rises to meet you. This is the location of the Scranton Strangler Strikes Again property. Now I mentioned the inversion principle earlier, and as I said, that video will be coming shortly. But to provide a very brief overview, the Scranton Strangler mystery follows an established pattern by the creators. And that pattern is one of inversion. If you've seen the episode identifying Scranton Strangler puzzles, you'll know that we have a motif around Michael being a genius, but he's stereotyped to be an idiot. If he's truly a genius, the stereotype has been inverted. If you've seen Scranton Strangler episode titles on this channel, you'll know that acronym creation is also inverted. A normal acronym is formed by taking the first letters of a lengthy title and forming a new word. Whereas in the office, we have the inverse where words are attributed an acronymic meaning. The norm has been inverted. Similarly, in a normal crime investigation, detectives will try and place a suspect within the vicinity of a crime. But once again, this has been inverted in the office, with our challenge actually being to place the crime scene within the vicinity of the suspect. So can we place Dexter Avenue in the vicinity of any suspect on the night of the Scranton Strangler serial murders? Firstly, Dexter Avenue is a four minute drive from Locust Ridge Quarry. Now we do find out from Jim that his house in the office universe is down by the quarry. Where's your place? Oh, it's on uh, Linden Ave. By the quarry? Oh. Cool beans, man. I live by the quarry. We should hang out by the quarry and throw things down there. Definitely we should. Now, Creed obviously also tells us that he lives by the quarry, but we also have very strong evidence to suggest that Creed also lives rent-free in the office. Four nights a week, I sleep under my desk, and then three nights, I stay at my place in Toronto. Now, Creed is a possible suspect, but we cannot definitively place the crime scene in the vicinity of the suspect. However, in the case of Dwight Schrute, we can firmly place the crime scene in the vicinity of the suspect. Dwight is told by Pam to go to their house to pick up an iPod. Dwight! iPod. I think it's on the kitchen table. Do not touch anything else. The key is under. I don't need a key. Okay, Dwight, but if you do need a key, just listen. It's under. The no, don't, 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 don't tell me. La, 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 la. Firstly, Dwight enters the house in extremely suspicious circumstances. Rather than searching for and using the key, he chooses to break the window instead. In addition to this, he also tells us that he did what anybody else would do. I did what anyone would do. I read a book, had a bath, I got a good night's sleep, and I made plans to eradicate it. Guys, nobody would do that. 
if your friend asked you to go to their house to pick up an iPod and you started smashing up their kitchen, you probably lose a friend. Nobody does that. It's simply not the thing that anybody would do. Dwight sleeping over at Jim and Pam's house would provide him with a base of operations and a safe house once he has committed the murders. We can also source his whereabouts exactly. We have video evidence that Dwight Schrute was definitively in the area where the crime occurred. But if you've been following this investigation attentively, you would have already seen Scranton Strangler Revealed Part 1, where we break down in detail, in advance to this episode, why Dwight Schrute is the Scranton Strangler. So Dwight being guilty on the day of the delivery would not come as a surprise. And I want to take a moment to inform all of you new listeners that the Scranton Strangler mystery is vastly more complex with depths that no one could have ever imagined than has been assumed up until now. Let this episode lay the standard for how difficult finding just one piece of the treasure map can be. This is a call to action to join the Anti-Strangling Task Force, bring the Scranton Strangler to justice, and exonerate the innocent Toby Flanderson. Don't forget to subscribe, turn on notifications, and join the Anti-Strangling Task Force on Patreon for exclusive episode analysis.